Well, good morning once again, and happy Mother's Day to each and every one of you. It is such a fitting day to to take a moment to honor uh, our moms and those who've provided a mothering role in our life for our own experience in uh, parenthood and to give thanks to God. And so we're going to do that in a moment. I'd like to pray a prayer of blessing uh, for our moms, Uh, but also to acknowledge that Mother's Day is actually a day that's loaded with all kinds of emotions for us. Uh, Some moms are filled with homes filled with noise and activity and mess, where other moms wake up to quiet homes where children are raised and are on their own. There are some who are anticipating motherhood in the future, while others look back on the past with uh, times of motherhood with gratitude and thanksgiving. Some enter into times of grief, recognizing that there's a mom who's no longer here or grieving a child who they've lost. Some moms are concerned with the, with the well-being of their children and with wanting to see their children journey in faith. Some are stepmoms navigating the challenge and the blessing of blended families. And then there are single moms who are seeking to do their very best. No matter where you are this morning, no matter what emotions you uh, feel on this Mother's Day, I want you to know that God is with you. And he has come to help you experience joy and peace and to strengthen you in the places he's called you to to serve and, and and to live out your relationships. And so on this Mother's Day, I'd like to pray a pastoral prayer of blessing And as I do, I'd like you to actually imagine your mom or someone who's played a mothering role in your life. Just bring them to mind. Or perhaps you want to actually think about your children or your grandchildren and just imagine them for a moment and present them to God. Not just the memories, but who they are. And as we take a moment to actually pray and to bring them to God, thankful for the gift that they are in our life and asking God to be close with them today. And even as we do that, I'd encourage you to pay attention to the emotions that that stirs within you and really help ask God for his help and his wisdom to know how to respond to all of that. So let's take a moment now and to pray. Blessing and thanksgiving to God for moms. Loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for mothers. For moms and grandmas and nanas. Thank you for mothers who gave birth to us. And for women who have treated us as their own children. Thank you that Motherhood is so reflective of your care for us as as your spiritual children. And Lord, I thank you for the sacrifice that each mom gives. Late nights spent comforting, rocking, listening. Hands that are weary from washing and wiping and hugging and writing. Thank you most of all for the gift of time that moms give to their families. We thank you for the flexibility of moms and for their tireless perseverance and devotion. God, help those who are mothers to to lovingly and wisely and with faith and great joy raise their children, not only in faith, but also to to be boys and girls and men and women of character. Lord, some of us are missing moms today. And some moms are missing children. And so we ask for your comfort. Be near to those who have been adopted. And for those who have given up a child for adoption. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal grace to those who have chosen to end a pregnancy. Comfort those who long to be mothers and could not. 
We ask for grace and healing in relationships where there is pain and disappointment. And Lord, we ask for strength for tired moms, that you would be a source of their spiritual and physical strength. We pray for single moms that you would give them wisdom and grace to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. May all our moms grow close in their trust of you and knowing that you, they are not alone. Lord, I pray for stressed out moms who desperately just want a moment of sanity or maybe quiet today. God, in your mercy, give them endurance for every question, every tantrum, every failure, every knowing that your grace is enough and that you are at work doing something beautiful and miraculous through them. We pray a prayer of blessing for our moms today. Would you give them special encouragement and strength? God of mothers, who created mothers and who came as a child and had a mother, Lord, would you love us and make us know your love in deeper and deeper ways and to reflect that to our families. Lord, as we come to your word today, I pray that you would speak to us by your spirit and that you would use your living word and your Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Jesus. As we celebrate and enjoy our families and our church families, hear our prayer, I pray. Amen. Why do we get sentimental when we're watching an old movie that we've seen a dozen times? Why do some of us trace back our family heritage generations? Why do we love puppies and Christmas Eve and old scrapbooks and photograph albums? Why do we appreciate it when someone unexpectedly remembers our birthday? Why, when we see a newborn baby, do we want to hold that little one? Why do we cry when we see someone get the golden buzzer on America's Got Talent? Well, at least I hear that some people cry when that happens. Why, when there is a calendar on the day for every possible thing under the sun, like National Pajama Day and International Talk Like a Pirate Day, and, and buy the church staff a coffee and drop it off mid-afternoon with a cookie day? Okay, that's actually not a day, but I think we could make it a day. Um, I really do. Why, when there's a day for every conceivable thing, does Mother's Day and Valentine's Day and even Thanksgiving Day hold such prominence above the rest? Why is loneliness such a dominant emotion for so many people? It's because you are hardwired for relationship. You and I were made to be relatable. When those emotions well up and you think, where's that coming from? It's coming out of who you are and who you were created to be. Whether you are a huge extrovert flaming in all of your relationships or a very quiet introvert, each and every one of us has the genuine, has the capacity and the need for genuine, life-giving relationships with others. And the reason for that is that you were made in the image of an eternal, loving, relational God. God is relational. God is not a solitary being. He is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally existing in perfect harmony and love. That's who God is. The Trinity isn't just a theological concept. It serves as a foundation for understanding the significant structure, structure and sanctity of our own relationships. Think about it. Families exist in every culture and society. The Institute of Marriage has been, um, has, was founded since creation. 
Relationships are not just what we do. They are who we are. And relationships are precious to God. They really matter. And that's why God's word gives so much instruction on what our relationships are to be about. All of our relationships, children to parent, parents to children, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, young to old, old to young, brothers and sisters, friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor. We're even told how to relate to strangers. Our relationships matter because they actually send a message to the world about the God we believe in. And when all is said and done, and our earthly possessions fade away, what will remain are the relationships. That's what we talk about at a celebration of life. The relationships that have been fostered in our life with God and with each other. In this series, we're going to delve into God's word and we're going to reflect on some profound truths about human relationships, be it marriage, family, or friendship. But we start today with God because we are created in the image of God and we are called to be transformed into the likeness of God. And to increasingly reflect the character of God. Not only in our life, but in our relationships. And God beautifully reflects and models what relationships can be like. We don't hear a lot about the Trinity these days. It's, it's kind of one of those subjects that's reserved for like kind of the theologians in the room. Um, you know, it, it doesn't seem that exciting. Maybe a little dry Because we really don't get the whole three in one thing. It's a little weird. And to be honest, the way the Trinity is most often explained is not nearly as exciting as other things like God's love and his grace or the salvation and eternal life he makes possible. In fact, I, I actually bet that if you were to describe to a friend or to a stranger what God is like, if someone asked you, can you tell me what God is like? Um, I imagine that the the subject of the Trinity would be pretty far down the list. You'd come to it, but not right away. What do I mean when I say Trinity? If the subject of the Trinity did come up, how would you explain it to someone? Would you use one of those examples you heard as a kid, like the Trinity is like an egg? It's got a shell, it's got a yolk, it's got some whites, three parts, one egg. Or maybe you use the shamrock, you know, one, one leaf or one plant with three leaves on it. Some compare the Trinity to H2O, to water, one substance that takes three forms, gas, liquid, and a solid. Now, describing God as an egg or as a plant or as a gas doesn't seem that exciting, that attractive, does it? My favorite description or metaphor was given to me by a Sunday school teacher who described the Trinity as a cherry pie. Now you have my attention. A cherry pie is made up of, you got the crust that kind of gives it structure and form. And then you got the cherries that that bring the fruit and the sweetness and the taste. And And then you have the kind of the, 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 the sauce or the, the filling that kind of flows all around it. Like that must be the Holy Spirit, right? Like so, so God is like a cherry pie. It sounds delicious. I just don't know how accurate it actually is and how it actually helps us get closer to understanding what is God like and how does that impact who I am. Here's a formal de- definition. There is one true and living God who is eternal, personal, spiritual, and intelligent. He is holy, almighty, unchangeable, infinitely powerful, wise, just, and loving. God is the creator, sustainer, redeemer, and sovereignly rules over all things, both seen and unseen. God exists in three United yet equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
each co-equal, co-eternal, having the same, the precisely the same nature and attributes, and worthy of precisely the same worship, confidence, and obedience. That is a loaded paragraph. And it can send us looking for an easier metaphor. I'll go back to the egg or to the pie because I can understand that. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around what it means for God to be Trinity. And why does it matter? It matters because it's the key to understanding who we are and how we are to relate to one another, not only within the family, but within the church family and how we're to relate to God as well. It, It has so much to speak to us. I want you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20, it's the fourth Gospel of the New Testament. And as you do, let me just tell you a couple of other resources that that might interest you in this whole topic. I've been reading over the last few months uh, a book by Michael Reeves, who's from Oxford University, and it's simply called Delighting in the Trinity. Delighting in the Trinity, and it's great. There's also another one called Experiencing the Trinity by Daryl Johnson from Regent College in Vancouver, and I would recommend both of them to you. But here in John 20, look at verse 31, because in verse 31, John gives us his mission statement, why he wrote the gospel. And this is what he says. Just before he issues this call to faith, He says, these, referring to the events in the life of Jesus, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Notice what's being said. This is a call to believe in Jesus. Not Jesus as just some religious teacher or Jesus, a first century uh, miracle worker, or Jesus, a prophet sent by God. This is a call for us to have faith in a triune God of which Jesus is fully a part. Jesus is the Son of God. God is his Father. But Jesus is also clearly God himself. We see this just moments earlier. If you look back to verse 28, Paul, uh, Thomas calls Jesus both my Lord and my God. He's calling Jesus the Christ. You are the Messiah. In Hebrew, it's translated the anointed one, the one who's been anointed by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself is God He is the Son of God in relationship to God the Father, and he is empowered by God the Holy Spirit, all in this relational unity of purpose and love. And wherever you you look at the life of Jesus, all the way through the gospel, the Trinity is always close by. I think it's amazing that some people claim that the Trinity isn't in the Bible because they can't find the word in their concordance. The Trinity is everywhere. Jesus has this ongoing interactive relationship with the Father and with the Spirit. They are always present, relating to each other and working together. By the way, have you ever wondered what was God doing before he created the world? Like in eternity past... It's hard for us to imagine eternity past. But in eternity past, what did God do? Like, was he just chilling? Was he just waiting? Well, verse 17, or sorry, John chapter 17, verse 24 tells us. So turn back there. John 17, 24. Because it actually tells us exactly what God was doing before creation. This is what Jesus says to God the Father. You loved me before the creation of the world. That's what God was doing for eternity. God the Father was loving 
his son in the power of the Spirit. For all of eternity, God the Father was loving his son in the power of his spirit. That's the God we're talking about. That's the God in whose image we are made. What does it mean to be a father? Father is a name filled with meaning. It simply is, at its most basic level, one who gives life. But even more so, in this case, it's one who loves, one who begets. And if God was eternally a father, eternally loving, eternally he's life-giving, we start to get a bit of an understanding of the Trinity. In fact, I think one of the best pictures of the Trinity we find um, right in the pages of Scripture, and it's Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River. If you have something to, if you want to explain the Trinity, especially to a child, just take them to the story of Jesus' baptism. And we find it in Matthew chapter 3. You can turn back there if you want. Matthew chapter 3, in verse 16, Jesus has gone out to the Jordan. John is out there baptizing. Jesus comes up to, waits in line, comes up to John, says, will you baptize me? The, John resists and Jesus says, no, we need to do this so that all righteousness might be fulfilled. And John consents, and he baptizes Jesus. And in verse 16 of Matthew 3, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Do you see it? The father declares his love for his son. This is my son, whom I love. And the Spirit is hovering on him, resting on him. For it's the Spirit that makes the love of the Father known to the Son. That's the God we're talking about. A father loving his son as he pours out his Spirit a blessing upon him. A love that the Father pours out on the Son causes the Son to respond with an echoing love. There is an incredible verse in Luke 10, 21, where we read this. It says, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. See, this is just the opposite of the baptism. At the baptism, the Father blesses the Son. And here in Luke 10, uh, the Son blesses the Father through the joy of the Holy Spirit. And my point is this. The Trinity should not be an afterthought, an add-on. It should be foundational to our understanding of what God is like. It informs us who we should be as individuals and as families God is eternally loving, eternally in relationship. And that's what makes the the triune God so utterly different than all other gods, all other religions. There's a lot of things that different faiths agree upon. The Trinity is not one of them. Just imagine for a moment if God was not a triune God. If he was what we'll call a single person God, dwelling for all of eternity on his own before creation, it's just him. He can't be loving because love needs an object. If he's just loving himself, aren't I great? I'm amazing. You look wonderful today. It's a bit narcissistic. 
It's selfish. It's anything but holy. And I am sure if God was a single person God for all of infinity past, he would have gotten very bored and perhaps even angry because he would be completely alone. We can have a lot of speculation about what a single person God would have done in eternity and we don't really know, but we do know this, he would be by himself. And in that regard, he would be a needy God. And the purpose of creation would be to meet his needs. I need servants to do my bidding. I need something to distract my attention. I need worshipers to tell me how great I am. I need companions to complete me. But this is what is so wonderful about the God who is. Jesus says, I don't call you servants. I don't need you. I call you friend. Only the triune God can we say is a God of love. He doesn't need us. For all of eternity, he has been in this reciprocal, ongoing, joy-filled, submission, submissive, honoring, loving relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the motivation for creation is so that others can join the circle of love and take a seat at the table of grace. Here is God who is love, who is full of love for all of eternity, that he's overflowing with it. And that overflowing love for others is why God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity past planned for salvation in which each one of them would play a part. And the goal of God's redemption, God's salvation, is so that we would believe and come into an eternal loving relationship with God that does not end. Romans 8 sums it up this way. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you, you received brought about your adoption to sonship. For by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The result of our faith in God's beautiful plan of redemption is that we get adopted into the family. It's kind of like when a bride and a groom have a dance at their wedding reception. And so the bride and the groom dance. And then the parents dance. And at some point they kind of break up and, and the bride goes and, and, and she dances with her father. And uh, the groom goes and dances with his mother. And then, there's, then, then the daughter-in-law and the son-in-law get included and, and it just starts growing bigger and bigger and bigger. The love of the parents spills over um, and into their, the life of their child and then it reaches beyond them to their new adopted child and the circle just keeps growing bigger and bigger. Now, I know that I'm being kind of idealistic here. Things aren't always this clean. But don't dismiss the principle because of the presence of brokenness, hurt, or sin. So how does this apply to our relationships with each other? Well, let me ask you a few questions. One, if you're married, have you ever thought of your marriage as a little trinity? You, your spouse, and God all together, as uh, Ecclesiastes would say, a cord of three strands. Do others catch a glimpse of the Trinity, the divine community of love in the way you relate and function as a couple? That's a big one. Think about this. How does your theology of God impact your practice of marriage? Maybe you are blessed to be a parent or a grandparent. Ask yourself, do you parent your children like God parented you? 
with patience and forgiveness and discipline. And for all of us, when we think about our relationships, ask yourself, do I manipulate my relationships so that I get my needs met? Do your friends, your kids, your spouse, your neighbors, the people you work with, do they see a reflection of God's love in your relationship with those who are in your life? You see, God is relatable. And he not only calls us, but he teaches us how to be relatable too. I want to take you to another place in the Bible. I want you to go to the end of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 4. So John's letter, the first of John's letters, just before Revelation, 1 John chapter 4, and I want us to look um, at chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Here's what it says. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is Love. What an incredibly powerful verse. Do you, do you know an older, mature uh, Christian who you deeply respect? Maybe you're actually having lunch with them today. Or maybe you're going to see them sometime soon. But I'm thinking about somebody who you would say is just lovely. Just a delight to be around. They've walked with, with the Lord for years. And you find that when you spend time with them, you just become nicer. You know what I mean? Like you almost catch yourself changing your behavior and your talk and your language when you're with them. You're happier, you're kinder, you're nicer. And it's not like you're faking it. I mean, you genuinely feel more loving when you're with them because of who they are. They always have words of encouragement and blessing. They don't, they don't talk behind other people's back. They're consistently loving and generous. And you find yourself being a nicer person in their presence. Now, don't worry. You change back when you leave them. You know, like it's kind of a temporary transformation too often. But that's just a little example of what it's like with God and how God changes us when we're with him. God is love in such a profound way that you cannot be with God without him starting to change you so that you become more loving yourself. But who are we talking about here? Who are the friends? The friends of God. We are. Look, look down at verse 9. 1 John 4, 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. John is describing God's love spilling over. God the Father sending God the Son in the power of God the Holy Spirit so that we might live, like truly live life to the full. Learn how to love and how to live through him. And so you begin to start seeing why the Trinity is so important when it comes to relationships and why it is such good news for all of us. Maybe next time somebody says, can you tell me about God? What's God like? Maybe you should start with the Trinity. I got to tell you. He's like eternally in relationship. It's unbelievable. He's overflowing with love. Because he's eternally loving. He's in this community of love and he wants us to be in the community of love with him. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that just fire you up? Let me bring some application when it comes to our relationships. As divine image bearers of those um, um, who are created in the image of God. We started out by talking about those longings that we have, those emotions that show up. And every one of us has those godly emotions and longings, longings to show dignity and to be shown dignity, longings to love and to be loved, to communicate and to be communicated to, to be a friend and to have friends, to be known and to know. Whether you realize it or not, we, all have, we are all longing for an unhindered loving relationship with God. 
The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in community, a community of dignity, love, communication, friendship, deep knowing, and selflessness. And despite the brokenness of humanity, those longings are woven into the fabric of your heart. And we're going to talk a lot about relationships in the weeks to come, but today I just want to simply use friendship as our example for our application. How, would you, how do you think God would evaluate your friendships? How does God's word influence your practice of friendship? Now, right off the bat, I will say some of us struggle with the concept of friendship. We like the idea of kind of being lone rangers because we have internal struggles. And, and so therefore, we, we portray this air of stability and confidence And we don't mind knowing others, but we really don't want others to know us. And so we kind of keep people at a distance. And the truth is, we kind of fight those triune uh, fingerprints that are on our own hearts. But none of us are meant to live in isolation. We were created for divine friendship with God and with each other. Others, the struggle's exactly the opposite. We love friendship. Like, we are right in there. We idolize friendship. But sometimes in a way that we end up getting disappointed. We drive people away. We practice friendship in a way that um, manipulates or harms others. We're inconsistent and we break trust. We sometimes elevate ourselves and and we protect ourselves and we hurt those who are around us. And, And we place undue pressure on our friends to satisfy our eternal longings that were really meant to be satisfied by God. But the good news is, is that God is a friend who has friends, and I will add, who teaches us to be a friend. He gives us a model of what divine friendship looks like. He models it for us. And so let me just give you a few suggestions of characteristics of divine friendship that we see in God. And the first one is love. In some ways, it's obvious, and in some ways, it's, a, it's maybe even a little too personal, But it's so important to God. Love in friendship is so critical that the Bible actually gives it its own name. Filio. Brotherly love. A friendly love. It incorporates the idea of an associate, a companion, someone you have friendly affection for, someone you choose to get to know, help, and care for, even when it's of no benefit to you personally. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times. And we simply need to ask ourselves, am I loving, am I a loving friend like Jesus was? Number two, loyalty. Within the Trinity, we see this unparalleled dedication to each other. Loyalty shows up in a steadfast commitment that says, I'm here for you for the long haul. I'm here. Despite circumstances and schedules and distance, I will be your friend. I'll be here especially when you are in need. Again, Proverbs tells us, it talks about a friend who sticks closer than a brother, closer than a sister. A friend for seasons of adversity. Three, honest communication. In the Trinity, we see this ongoing dialogue and communication that happens for all of eternity. And whenever we get a glimpse of that conversation in the Bible, the Son talking to the Father, the Father talking to the Son, the Spirit revealing something, God doesn't waste words. The dialogue is intimate, straightforward, encouraging, often joyful, sometimes challenging, like Jesus' words on the cross, but it's always honest and respectful. If you were to record your conversations that you have with your friends or the people you work with or the people you spend your day with, what would those conversations tell you? Could you improve the content of your communication and make it more honest and respectful and deep? Fourth, mercy, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Now, there's actually no need for these in the Trinity because there's actually no sin present. God is holy. But God reveals himself as a God of forgiveness and mercy, and he extends these divine attributes over us as his children time and again. 
Mercy looks, allows us to overlook an offense. Grace means that failure is not the end. And in Ephesians 4.31, which is a great friendship verse, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice and be kind, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. Where do you need to move towards forgiveness and mercy and grace in your friendships? Fifth, let me suggest wisdom. God is full of wisdom and truth, and wisdom is, is sown in a season. When it, when it is, it is such a gift in friendship. Being a good sounding board when needed, pointing others back to biblical principles, helping a friend discern the voice of God in order to make sound decisions. Oh, we need wisdom. Six, joy. Have fun. Some friendships are so drab and they just need a makeover of joy. Dallas Willard in his book, Divine Conspiracy, reminds us that God is full of joy. He says, undoubtedly, God is the most joyous being in the universe. And so be like God. Lighten up. Final characteristics, and there's so many more that we could say, is simply eternity. We are eternal beings. Michael W. Smith after all, was correct after all. Friends are friends forever, if the Lord's the Lord of them. God is eternal, and everlasting life means just that. When you are attend the funeral of a loved one, or of a friend who knows Jesus, as some of us have done recently, we come to say farewell and not goodbye until we meet again. Because of Jesus and the grace and the life of the cross and our salvation, we will be friends forever. The doctrine of the Trinity allows us to view our relationships, our families, and our friendships correctly. It shows us that we are hardwired for relationships. You and I were made to be relatable because you were made in the image of an eternal, loving, relational God who wants his love to overflow to you today. Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you for who you are. Help us to know you in greater ways. Help us to experience your love in deeper ways. And help us to reflect you to others in our families, in our friendships. May people get a glimpse of you. And Lord, I pray that wherever our knowledge, our understanding of you has been, is, has, has been misinformed or is incomplete, I pray that you would just continue to reveal yourself to us by your word and through your spirit. Transform us and make us more and more like Jesus the Son. And we pray all this in his beautiful name. Amen.